So Paul's hanging in Ephesus while we finish uh, his letters to the First Corinthians. He does leave after writing First Corinthians and move on, which we'll pick up with when we finish this book. Which we're we're kind of getting down the road here. We're we're in chapter eleven, starting tonight, which of sixteen. So we've gotten down the road a little bit uh, because of the lateness of tonight's start. We won't go uh, past eleven for sure, and may not get past the first part of chapter eleven. But um, so we got Paul. Paul's hanging right over here in Ephesus, right over here, corner straight across there in the, uh, right, right over here, Ephesus there, over here. So that church at Corinth, and um, we just finished talking about meat offered to idols, but not just meat offered to idols, the um, talking about the major question of, you know, what all things being lawful to me and all that kind of stuff. And uh, again, to recap from there. When Paul wrote and said to the church, uh, all things are lawful to me, but all, all, all things are not expedient, it was not a doctrinal establishment that everything was lawful. It was apparently a phraseology used in the church uh, that all things are lawful to me, and Paul was using it as a rhetorical response, not telling them, hey, everything's lawful for you to do. Because if that were true, then, you know, then incest or rape or murder would be lawful if all things are lawful and that's not what he's saying, uh, and it's borne out through some Greek scholars, and even some translations put that statement in a um, quote as if Paul was quoting them um, and saying all things are lawful to me. So uh, understand that. We're, we're down here in 1 Corinthians. We're getting into chapter 11, and Paul begins this chapter. So let's, let's, uh, let's get in there. Hallelujah. He says, um, yeah. Starts in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Be followers of me, even also as I am of Christ. Now, here is the qualifier for following ministries. They have to follow Christ. Amen. If they're not following the Lord, you don't follow them. If they start teaching things the Bible doesn't teach, you don't follow them. Uh, if they start acting ways that, that, that don't represent the Bible, you don't follow them. Okay, uh, you're to follow them. You're to follow their, their example as long as their example is a Christ-like example, and what they're teaching is Christ, is, is is godly or word of God. You just don't go follow somebody who you know says, "Well, I'm out beyond the Bible, uh, and you're too far out from me, and I'm out the door." All right, or they start saying, "Well, you know, the Bible's a good book, but we we uh, we use it as a reference point, but that's not the fine, you know uh, things have changed. You know, well, when they start when, anytime the Bible." Or the word of God becomes or loses its place of final authority, I'm out the door. Okay? You're not getting anything that's beyond the Bible. All right. So Paul says, you know, so he starts out, be followers of me even as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things to keep the ordinances that I delivered to you. Um, and so he's saying, you know, hey, you guys, you know, he's commending them here. And um, but then verse 3, he begins to go into a, another question. Now remember, he started about verse 8, he started answering questions they had sent to him. And um, addressing, one of, the, one of the big things they had was meat offered to idols. He's about to enter into one that has, that has uh, most people just stay away from these days. When you're doing a chronological study and doing an ex exegetical study where you're going, you know, by, verse by verse throughout an entire book, you can't skip it no matter how much you want to. And it's the woman question, you know. A lot of people leave it alone because they, they don't want to upset the women. You know, and then there's, there's things here, and there's things here that are misunderstood and misapplied. You know, when men run around telling them, why to submit? You got to submit. You got to do what I say. Well, that's, that's not the biblical pattern either. Amen. If you love your wife as Christ loved the church, you don't treat her like a dog. Amen. Hello? You don't treat her like she's a second-class citizen. All right? So let's look at the verses uh, 1 through. Well, we'll read them, and then we'll come back and... and um, uh, Verse 17, we'll read those verses. Now I praise you, brethren, in verse 3, but I would, not, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But the woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her husband, or, or her head, and, and that is even all one as if she were shaven. And for if the woman be, should not be covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. 
Now, some people don't like this. I don't, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's in here. You know, you got you to get rid of your, your, the new modern feminazi mindset. I mean, just to be honest with you, you know, women have a role, men have a role, and we can't make them the same. You're not a man, and, my, and men are not women. And no matter what you do and the kind of operations you have, you still got chromosomes that make you what you is. Amen. No way around it. All right. And I might lose some fans here, but that, you know, that's, we, we just got to stay with the Bible. Amen. If it's not popular, tough. Everybody say tough. You know? For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this calls all the woman to have power on her head, or uh, that is a coverage and sign that she is under the uh, power of her husband. That's a, that's a translation or, or margin here. Power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. Now we're going to go, we'll, get to, we'll get to some of these things. For as a woman is of the man, so also is the man also by the woman. But all things are of God. Judge in yourselves, it is comely that a woman, uh, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if the woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if a man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. All right, now. I'm going to read to you from the complete biblical library some commentary here, going verse by verse. And uh, they, they cover this, uh, you know, um, probably better than I will. So I'm going to read theirs. And uh, help you. this was written, this was a uh, complete biblical library published by, in Springfield, Missouri. Um, it is no longer in print. Uh, it is electronically, you can obtain it electronically, but you can't obtain it in, in hard copy. Verse 3. But I would you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Some have denounced Paul as a woman hater. But we must remember it was Paul who ins insisted that in Christ all distinctions were to be removed between Jew and Greek, bond and free, male and female, over in Galatians 3.28. These are some of the most radical words ever uttered concerning social and religious matters. The context shows us that in the Corinthian church, women took an active part and the worship services, unlike those in the Jewish synagogue, which were not, not allowed such freedom. Some of these women might have misunderstood their newfound freedom and refrained from wearing the head covering, which was custom dictated, I'm sorry, which custom dictated they should wear when prophesying or praying in public. This is the problem which now Paul now addresses. The apostle stated the chain of command for the first century church. God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. If this principle is examined closely, it reveals an important fact. Subordination does not mean inferiority. Okay? The sexes are equal mentally, morally, and spiritually. But there is still a chain of command. There is still an establishment of authority in the marriage relationship. And you got to understand, this is obviously in reference, uh, a lot of this, to a husband and wife. Now, the man being the head of the woman doesn't mean he's a god. That he, you know, he speaks and she's got to jump up and down and say, yes, master. Okay? It is, it is the way that is, it, there is an establishment of authority that God has placed here. <clears throat> head refers to a governing, controlling, and ruling organ. It, it, organ. it indicates a relationship of authority. The head of every man is Christ. Began the discussion. Every man has one head, Christ. The head of the woman is the man. Establishes the order of authority God has ordained. Man holds headship directly from his creator, and this is brought by his manhood into re direct responsibility to Christ. The very law of marriage and the social order are grounded in Christ. On one side the, of submission, the Lord set the pattern with his perfect loyalty and obedience to the Father. This should make it easy to submit. When we see Christ is a subject to God the Father and man to the head, Christ. In nature, there is equality in office and work there is submission. It's just like in the local church. 
<clears throat> the pastor is the head of the local church. He is the authority. But in, per in, in personal relationship between you and the Lord, I have no better standing or better place. But in our relationship in the church, I'm the head. Does it make me superior? It's just the rule of, it's, it's the rule of authority the, or the chain of command, how it works. But you have your own personal, private relationship relationship with the Lord. But in operation in the church, you don't, can't come here and go, well, I, I have a relationship with the Lord just like you do, and I'm running everything now. It doesn't work that way. And it won't work in a marriage. Hello? Now, this has to be taken in light of other things Paul said. You just can't run out here and start, well, women have to submit. You know, we, we go to the book of Ephesians where Paul talks about that the wives are to submit unto the husbands, but the husbands are to love their wife. You cannot exercise proper biblical authority without operating and exercising proper biblical love. Amen. So the men who hear this, around, well, praise God, woman got to submit me. She got to do whatever I say do. Listen, I've heard some, some squirrely stuff men start telling their wives they had to do. Let me tell you something. What they were telling them what they had to do was outside the love of God and outside the parameters of walking in love and loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Therefore, it is not, a, it is not valid authority exercising. Hello? Are you here? No, that's going to get real blunt with you. I heard of one case where a man was telling his wife she had to sleep with another man so he could watch it because he was, he was kinky. And, and, and she had to do it because he, um, he was the head. And she was a Christian. She had to obey. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you do not have to violate. You cannot tell if you're, if you're the husband and Christ is your head, you would not tell your wife to submit to you, tell her to do things that your head would not allow you to tell her to tell her to do. Now, see, you think we really, really, we really shouldn't have to address these things but folks people do this stuff and so we have to address them so that we understand we are not obligated no one is obligated to violate the word pastors can't make you violate it in, in the church husbands can't make women violate it in, the, in their marriage okay so in social and religious or on office as far as office is concerned or work is concerned Certainly there is a submission, but in nature, in, in other words, in your individual relationship, there is, there is equality. Now, verse 4, uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't read verse 3 yet, but I would have you know that the head of every woman is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, the head of the Christ is God. So God has, a, he has an authority. The father, the son, the man, the woman. Remember, the man, the woman came out of man. We, and we get into some of these things. Verse 4, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Dishonors his head. And, all right, so verse 4, this principle applied directly to the covering of women. Paul first wrote of the uncovered man. This was strictly a Christian matter for the Jewish males covered their head. Remember, they, they wear the little uh, beanie cap, and I forgot what they call it. There's a name for it, the little cap. Of the... Yeah. Yama. Okay. Man's only head is Christ, and while both sexes worship him in common, women also ha has man as her head. The man who wore covering dishonored his own place, and this reflected on Christ. For he shamed Christ, whose lordship he represented. You're probably going to need to listen to this, because there's a lot to cover here, and I'm not going to be able to read it 14 times. Okay? Verse 5, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonors her head. For then it is all, even all as one is she were shaven. Now, when they, um, a lot of times in these days, well, well, I'll read it. The identical situation was repeated for the woman. It seems likely the reference, prayeth or prophesieth, is to women who participated in public worship. It is important to recognize that verse 5 makes it quite apparent that women were in fact praying and prophesying in church. So they were still functioning and operating, but they were to do it in a manner that represented, see there, there's allegories here. The man having his head uncovered, you know, rep representing Christ as the head. The woman having hers covered in submission, you know. So we, we, we have, the, and listen, submission is not a bad word. Hello. Remember the, the, uh, the centurion? 
He said, I'm a man under authority, and, 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 and say to this one, come, and he cometh. To this one, go, and he goeth. To another, do this, and he doeth it. See, his authority was, was vested in his submission. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes you just want to be the one that's submitted and not the one that's in authority. It's easier. You can run hide behind the one that's in charge. Say, they, they, they're, that's their, they're in charge. All right. The problem Paul dealt with was not the fact that women praying and prophesying, but the way they did it. If Paul disapproved of women praying and prophesying in the church, he could have explicitly said so. Instead, Paul corrected the disorderly manner of their praying and prophesying by telling them that they, uh, when they did, this, did pray and prophesy, they must do it with their heads covered. This was symbolic of being submitted to the man. So as the man submitted to Christ, the woman was supposed to be submitted to the man, and it was to demonstrate that there was an order. God has an order. I said, God has an order <clears throat> in operation. Hallelujah. This is the background by which to better understand um, the 14th chapter of this book. It was necessary for women to have her head covered as a sign of submission to the man. If she did not, if she did not do so, she dishonored her head. This dishonor done to the man fell on her and the same came to her. Again, it is also reflected on Christ's lordship. For her to submit detracted nothing from her equality to man. To the head cover in verse 10 called power may seem to be in a paradoxical meaning of standing under authority and being endowed with authority. Okay? Verse 6, for if the woman had not covered, be let her be shorn, but it's a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. Uh, it was agreed that this was shameful for a woman to be shaved or shorn. According to Deuteronomy 21, 12, for instance, women captured in war were to have their heads shaved as a sign of shame. It was unwomanly Rather manly. <laughs> Duh. Look at, look at the society today. I mean, we, you know, we got, we got women just, they look like men walking around. They're, they're, they're buzz cuts and all this kind of stuff. You know? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, we're, we're zoned in on you, Jeff. Okay, um, you, you'll see, I've seen women, you know, they, they well, there's one, one little you know, music star now, used to be a, a, a singer in a little television show on, one, on Disney, and uh, she's gone off the deep end with shaving her head and stuff. She's adorable with her hair. She looks horrible with her hair, head shaved and all weirded out and stuff. You know, women, you should have hair. It's good to have hair. Buzzed out, he's not... Attractive. Who are you to tell us that? Well, the Bible told us that it was a shame for to have their head shorn. Therefore, being a veil was also a shame. The veil, thus the veil was to be used. Verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Paul drew support from his position from the story of creation. Man was made in the direct image of God. Woman appeared in creation as derived an auxiliary. Now remember, woman was taken from the man. Okay? It was as wrong for a man to cover his head as it was for the woman not to. For man to cover himself would be to hide the image and glory of God. Man is the pinnacle of creation and should reveal God's glory. Therefore, there should no be, outward, there be no outward sign of subordination when a man worships. Woman, in her right, stands in a position singular in nature to the man and therefore is the glory of the man. This affords her a high position and at the same time protects man's place. Faith, purity, and beauty show most exactly and proportionally in her. The man who degrades a woman degrades his manhood. Hello? And can somebody get me some water? For the man is not the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither the man was created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The two more fours are added to, claim, uh, to chain beginning with verse 6. Paul was speaking of origin and purpose in creation. In origin, woman came from Adam's rib, and in purpose, she was to be his helper and companion. Originally in creation, man did not come from woman, nor was he created for her. To ignore and dis or discredit this arrangement of God is to invite problems. 
we, we live in a society that, you know, I mean, it's all about, you know, uh, women being as equal to men or superior to men or can do anything a man can do. And, you know, and, and I beg to differ. Get you the best karate woman on the planet and get the best karate guy on the planet, and guess who's going to win? The man's going to win. Get the strongest powerlifter woman and get the strongest powerlifter man. Which one's going to win? The man's going to win. They're just built that way. Hello? Now, unless they're taking steroids. And you have people do that. People, you know, take, women take steroids to be more, you know, to be more masculine. But if you take, the, you take the five best women basketball players in the world, take the five best, best men basketball players in the world, guess who's going to win the ball game? The men are. I, I like to see what, who's going to push LeBron around. Women. Or Kevin Durant. Or Kevin Durant, I'm sorry. I mean, you know, let's face it. What, what woman NBA, WNBA player is going to take and push uh, Shaquille out of the lane? He could come back, and, and, and how many years has he been retired now? He could come back and go in there, and they're not going to push him around. And so there are differences between the man and the woman. Hello. There just are. We're created with different roles and different purposes. And it's not in a superior or an inferior thing, it is just we have different roles. And to try to claim that we can do, you know, listen, men can't have babies. And they would probably quit if they tried. If they could go into, if they could channel the pain over to the man and let him try to have a baby, he'd quit. Hello? You know, you get, you get a woman with a room full of three or four or five, six kids, and they, they, got them, they can handle it. Put a man in there, and he's screaming for help. There are things in our makeup, in creation, that make, make men and women different in their roles. But in their position with Christ, they're equal. Okay? So we, 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 just, we need to kind of stop listening to the, to the anti-Christ spirit of the last 70 to 80 years. And we need to become, listen, you've got men now who aren't even comfortable being men anymore. Girls like sissy boys with skinny jeans. Hello. Who acts, you know, and I always talk about men being in touch with their feminine side. I, I, yeah, if I'm in touch with my feminine side, I'm holding on to Janie. <laughs> All right? She's my feminine side. And the Bible says the two should become one flesh. That's my feminine side, her. Are y'all here? I'm not, I don't, not trying to be womanly. But you know, we got men, you know, so the, the society has so disrupted. And where, think about this, what is that, Satan? God created it that way. We got, women, we got a generation of women who, want to, who try to prove they don't need a man. I don't need no man. Well, you were made, we were, we were made to be together. We were men and women joined in marriage. That was God's design. Not men and men or women and women. We have scriptures about that. We'll get to that when we get to Romans and some other places. Y'all are, are just so excited. Could y'all could y'all show a little more enthusiasm? Verse 12. There is a balance between equality and subordination. Man is the initial cause. Women was the, women, woman was the instrumental cause. So the initial cause and the instrumental clause, cause. But the original source and rule to whom reverence is due is God. Verse 13, judge in yourselves, it is coming that a woman pray uncovered. Paul asked his readers to look at this carefully and judge. The inference was that they would come up with the same conclusion. Yourselves is emphatic. They could discover the truth for themselves. There is an appeal both to the fitness and suitability of things to nature or character and common sense. The matter hinges on general propriety and the Christian influence involved with it. And Paul was sure that when the Corinthians rightly considered this custom, they would not find it improper. Verse 14 and 15, but doth not even nature itself teach you that if the man having long hair is a shame to him, but if the woman have long hair is a glory, for her hair is given for a covering. Paul appealed to the instincts and teaching of nature and support to a related item, that a man's moral constitution... This reference to the moral nature of the world is true of other times Paul used 
uh, fusus, the Greek word fusus for nature, such as Romans 1, 26, where Paul condemns ho homosexuality because it is against nature, against God, God's moral ordering of the world. The preference for a man to wear short hair has prevailed in modern times as it did in ancient eras. It is true there have been exceptions. Homer's warriors wore long hair and fashion was retained at Sparta. But the uh, Athenian cropped his head when 18, and except for aristocratic knights, it was a mark of effemacy, eph effemacy to grow the hair long. The Nazarite of the Old Testament times was another exception. On the other hand, a woman's long hair is her glory. It is the crown of her beauty. Her hair served as a natural covering. In addition to the physical covering to be worn in public meetings, Paul, Paul's reasoning was that it was necessary that there be a clear distinction of sexes in appearance as well as other natural and scriptural ways. There remains the principle of subordination, the man to Christ, the woman to the man. Okay. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, we neither the churches of God. Verse 16. Abruptly, Paul cuts off the discussion with his reference to custom and contention. Contentious refers to a quarrelsome person, one who disputes for the sake of disputing. Disputing. My brother-in-law is that way. Janie's brother. He will, he'll just take an argument and start it just so he can argue the other side, even if he doesn't believe in it, because he loves to argue. I mean, he'll just get, he'll just, he'll bring it up and get you going and just take the opposite side just because he likes to do it, even if he doesn't believe it, okay? That's Janie's, it's the, it's the oldest of the brothers. It's still younger than her. Many arguments have, I'm sorry, it seems this attitude among the Corinthians touched everything, a woman's veil or the position of an apostle. Many arguments have come over Paul's use of the word custom here. Paul seems to be saying we had no such custom as women praying or prophesying with the head covered, uncovered. Paul appealed to universal custom and to the fact that this was the habit in the Christian churches to adopt another view would suggest that Paul was doing away with he had just spent 15 verses assuring. Paul was not supposing a custom per se, but a principle with the custom was lean. There must be a clear distinction of the sexes, a clear recognition of roles, and a proper order of authority that God established. And this is where he finishes this, this particular uh, discourse. So what we have here is when we run in and jump in the middle of this and take something out and run off with it, this is where we get into trouble. You know, although I'm the head of the wife and the woman, you, I'm the head of you. Okay, or some woman going around, well, my husband told me I had to submit, so I did such and such, such, and it was a violation of the Word of God. Amen. See, no, this, this is talking about roles. We do have roles. Hello? Did you know it's, it's, it's godly for women to raise the children? Sure, the, the father has a role in that, but it is the role, I mean, the, it is the primary role of the mother to nurture and, and govern the house. And this was so in our country until World War II. During World War II, when the men were fighting in, in, in the, uh, different theaters, uh, women went into the workforce, make manufacturing ordinances and weapons and tanks and stuff in the factories and didn't want to go back home. But up until then, it was, it, it was pretty well understood just from natural whatever. The man went out and supplied. And let's, let's face it. And people, well, we make more money now. Back in the day, the, the man was able to go out and support the family of three or four, whatever, on his own salary by himself. Now we live in a society where both parents have to work, basically, to support that same lifestyle. It, inflation just ate it all up. The women went out into the workforce, and so, you know, things got more expensive. And you know, now we got women who, who work to their 40 to have any children because they want to have everybody wants to have everything right and you know, all that kind of stuff. You know? It's, it's, the glory, it's, it's a wonderful thing for the wife to guide the house. And there's nothing wrong with that. I heard one movie star recently say that uh, she, she works harder than the, the, the stay-at-home mom. Uh, right. Because you go on a movie set and somebody's nanny, some nanny's taking care of your youngins while you're out you know, traveling all over the place sh filming 17 hours a day. And you're, you work as hard as the mom who's at home. I forgot, somebody did a, did a figure, if they figured if a woman got paid for what, it, uh, it, what they would have to hire somebody to do as the wife of a, of a stay-at-home stay mom, that's, you know, you know, that's really not, that's kind of an oxymoron. That was how it was supposed to be. You know, they would make well over $100,000 a year. 
staying home, guiding the house, cooking, being, being the Proverbs 31 woman, being industrious, finding sales, making things work, taking care of the, the, those things. Man's out earning, I was out making the income, earning the, you know, back in the other days, he'd be out in the fields, you know, taking care of the fields, taking care of the stock, doing these different things and, and creating the income. But the woman was being industrious with that income and raising the children in a godly way. Sure, the fathers have a role in the child rearing, but it's, it's not as, as, as reversed and messed up as it is today. You got, you got stay-at-home dads now. You got Mr. Mom. They're going to stay home while the wife goes out because she can get a job. You know, make, let, me, let me say this. How many have ever turned on a football game or a basketball game or a baseball game and they got the camera on the guy and he goes, Hey, Dad. I always say, hey, mom, it's, there, there, there is that, the dad is the role model of, of, manly, of manliness to the sons. He is the uh, role of how a husband is to be to the daughters. In other words, demonstrating that kind of lifestyle with his wife. But it's the nurture, the nurturing comes from the mother. They're designed to be nurturers. It's built into them. They're just designed that way. Men have to, you know, work, work real hard at it. Hello? It doesn't come natural to them to be like the mother. The mom is going, oh, sweetheart, come here. And they love on the man saying, get up from there. Tired of that fuss. Well, that's why you need to listen to your wife in that circumstance. She's the guy, she's guiding the house. She's got some insight. You brick hard lack of compassion individual. No, it's, it's men are designed different than women. And we, we cannot lose sight of that. And their society has changed the roles. And everybody's fighting, you know, and everybody's fighting to, to be this, to be that. You know, and we got we got these these militant women out there who are trying to demean men at every corner and every opportunity and make women you know, more powerful than men. And, and it's like some kind of get back. When God designed the woman, because she came out of the man, to be a guide in the house, to be, a, to be virtuous, to be wise, doesn't mean she is inferior. That means she's stupid. Hello? Actually, she's, she, she's a... She's a uh, deposit and wealth of counsel and wisdom to the man if they'll listen. Amen. Hello. So this, this first 16 chapter verses here, or 15 verses in this chapter, we're referring to roles, the proper exercising of those roles in public, in this case in public worship. Um, to deviate from that would bring shame. There are some things that take place in the church Some people know, um, like slavery. If you'll go back and study it, Paul did not denounce slavery in the sense of, we got to do away with this. Because they had it had in his day. He simply said, in your, whatever role you're functioning right now, do it and, uh, and honor the Lord. Does that, you know, does that mean that slavery shouldn't come to an end? No, that doesn't, that, that's not what it meant. But don't dishonor the Lord while the, the necessary things take place to change that. Maintain the, the right role. You know, honor your master as you, the Lord. You know, take care of your servants. You know, uh, treat them with fairness. Don't be, don't be evil to them. He gave instruction on all that instead of saying, well, set them free. He didn't even say that. Why? Because, because it, would bring, it was going to bring a, dis, it would bring a disruption in society that it wasn't ready for. However, in due season, it did change. In their, in their arena. And of course in America it did too. The founders left, it, left the, the, uh, the um, issue of slavery for another day by allowing amendments to the Constitution knowing that eventually one day there would be a change and an amendment that, uh, that did away with slavery but they couldn't do it at the time. They would have destroyed the attempt to unite the, the states. And on that note, just in case you think the North was in the Civil War is all about Ending slavery, then why did the northern states fighting for the north 
have slaves. There were northern states that were slave states. They weren't fighting to free the slaves. They were fighting for other reasons. Lincoln used that as a primary calling card, but that wasn't the whole reason the war was fought. We make it out it's all about that. It wasn't. I mean, you had northern states that were slave states. Had the time come? Obviously it had come. And there was, took, it still took another uh, 20 or 30 years of, of amendments to the Constitution to finally fin finalize, finalize all the stuff that ended when the Civil War ended. The, the, the voting and, uh, not, and not circumventing the votes and you know, allowing uh, eat one vote for one person, that kind of stuff. Lots, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments and through there, it took some effort there to write the con to amend the Constitution so that slavery was fully abolished and, the, and, and equality in, in rights and standing took place. Okay, it didn't happen the day the, the Civil War was over. All right, and so Paul's addressing issues of customs and things in the church that women had, it was, it was right in, in, in the understanding of their culture for women to have their head covered. It, it was a sign. Now, we come to church today, not having your head covered doesn't mean you, disre you re disrespect your husband now. In that era, it did. And so it's right for the church to make, you see, if you, if you go back here, particularly this thing, this being a custom, with this being a custom in the churches, and try to institute in the church today, you're going to get yourself in trouble. The principle is in force, not necessarily that custom. Okay? The principle of sub, uh, being subordinate, the man being the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of man, and God is the head of Christ. Those principles are in force. But again, when we say head, don't, women, I'm going to be honest, don't get uptight. And don't start going, oh, my God, my husband. You know, if you start thinking, oh, Lord, he's going to be telling me what I can and can't do. That's not, that's not what this submission was about. Okay? Because honestly, in, in Paul's other writings on the church, uh, particularly Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 22nd through the 33rd verses, uh, man's relationship to his wife was a loving, caring, nur over, uh, uh, nurturing her relationship. And he loved her, even no one yet ever hated his own flesh. He took care of her like he would take care of his flesh. Well, see, that's, that is the atmosphere in which submission can take place. It's easy to submit to someone when you know they got your best interest at heart and they're not going to abuse your submission in a way that's hurtful or damaging to you. And the interesting thing is when Paul got to the church, the letter to the church at Ephesus, his emphasis was that the man had to love the wife. They did not say the wife had to love the man. The woman had to submit to him, but the man had to love her. Why? Because that is the atmosphere in which biblical submission can take place. If Christ is the head of man, we know Christ loves us. He died for us. Amen? God loves Christ. Christ loves man. Man is to love his wife in that same manner. So all this is about roles and submission in, in office and work, but not in your personal relationship with the Lord. Therefore, you are not obligated to violate the word of God, no matter what anybody tells you. Amen. All right. We do not have time to go further. This was, this was not fun. I, I don't like teaching along these lines either because, you know, you got so many people who get so upset. They get mad at you. You write nasty emails and letters and all this kind of stuff. And so let's take up an offering and go home.